It's Tuesday, April the 27th. I'm Martin Gagel with Radius Research. Today we're joined by Andrew White, CEO, and Mark Coral, CFO of Char Technologies. That's YES on the Venture Exchange. Char is a clean tech company with core high temperature pyrolysis technology used for organic to biomass conversion and biocarbon creation. Andrew, Mark, thanks for joining us today. Let's hear your pitch. Awesome. Thanks, Martin. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us uh, for, for the live version. Uh, good morning to the West Coast. Good afternoon to the East Coast. And uh, it's a, a pleasure to be here and, and to be able to talk to you about uh, Char Technologies today. So the, the quick um, kind of highlights, they, these are all the points that we're going to talk about through the presentation. Um, but the key, as, as Martin said in his introduction, is that, you know, our core technology is high temperature pyrolysis, which specializes in converting woody materials and organic waste into different renewable gases, renewable natural gas and green hydrogen, uh, as well as different biocarbons. The process itself is carbon negative. Um, if you look at the technology landscape, we're very much on the leading edge and we have some proprietary aspects of the technology. Uh, the system produces its own energy. So when it operates, uh, it, it kind of runs itself. It's called autothermal and I'll get more into that in, in the later slides. Uh, we add value uh, to the materials we process. So generally we're processing wood waste organic waste that have limited to negative value and we're creating some of these higher value products. Um, and from a, a corporate side, uh, we have both a system sales and recurring revenue model where we're selling equipment and, and deriving recurring revenue from uh, services, from management fees and the like. And we also pursue a utility model ownership where we have the facility ourselves and, and we're able to fully uh, realize the, the revenue from some of these product outputs. And of course, the, the final bit that I'll talk a little bit more about is our metallurgical coal replacement that we call uh, clean fire. And the final uh, highlight here is that we do have active proposals out and, and we define active as, you know, we've, we've had a conversation with the client and, and a initial proposal has been submitted to them of over a hundred million dollars. Uh, we now have a strong balance sheet uh, as of February with a recent financing and we continue to have no debt. So as a, at a high level char, we're a clean tech and environmentally sustainable solutions company. And our focus is on global change by implementing these uh, solutions. And really our vision is to continue to be leaders in industrial clean air, water, soils, and waste with an emphasis on the circular economy. As an overview of the company, uh, we are traded on the venture under the ticker YES, and we operate with two groups. The first is Alltech Environmental Consulting. So that's a process engineering, environmental engineering services and compliance group. Uh, it brings in good recurring revenue. It is a good lead generator for some of our technology projects. It allows us to do environmental permitting for our own projects. So we bring all of that in-house and we have the ability to share process engineers between Alltech and our other group, Chartec Solutions. And Chartec Solutions will be the focus of this presentation. Uh, it's the group where we have our industrial clean technologies for both clean water, as well as our high temperature pyrolysis for waste reduction and renewable energy generation. A quick overview over the past uh, few years, um, with kind of COVID, we were able to more or less balance out our EBITDA to make sure that we were uh, making it through the year uh, comfortably with all of the uncertainty going on in the world. And the most important aspect is on February 5th, we closed a $6 million private placement, which uh, shored up the balance sheet and gives us the, you know, the ammunition to go after a lot of these projects that we're pursuing uh, much more aggressively. So a couple of additional highlights to date, Char Technologies as the, the parent company, uh, you know, we continue to find good efficiencies. We balance the EBITDA uh, as we needed to. Uh, we're now back in investing mode. Uh, we have no debt on the balance sheet and we've obviously seen a increase in capital markets interest, uh, which was so far culminated with the $6 million private placement in February. Uh, our Alltech group did continue to see some revenue growth despite some of the challenges over the last year. Uh, and part of that was with the opportunity to quickly pivot to new service op offerings, 
you know, some of the ability to move things virtually. And finally, on the real kind of step change group, the, you know, where we're going to see the real growth in Chartech solutions, uh, we continue to get market validation with a large order for our clean fire product, which we'll talk more about in a couple slides. And we've seen a lot of activity in our renewable natural gas and green hydrogen uh, project development opportunities. So now we get into the, the real fun stuff and that's the technology. So uh, high temperature pyrolysis is the core of what we do. And this graphic on the right helps explain it uh, in, a, in a fairly simplistic form. In general, we take challenging organic uh, streams. That's that bottom row. So you see in the red digestate. Uh, digestate is actually the leftover from a traditional renewable natural gas plant. Uh, for those of you who follow uh, other publicly traded companies like Zbeck or Greenlane, uh, they provide gas upgrading to these uh, what are called anaerobic digesters. They make renewable natural gas, but they also make a solid uh, byproduct that is challenging to manage, and that's called digestate, and that's one of our potential inputs. The other biosolids, similar fashion, except it comes from wastewater treatment plants, uh, things like manures uh, blended with compost and wood and agricultural materials. That all goes into our reactor, this high temperature pyrolysis, where it's processed in the complete absence of oxygen, so nothing burns, it thermochemically converts into two output products. And so we keep it in the reactor, it's a continuous process, temperature range is about 800 degrees Celsius, and again, no oxygen. And that allows us to create our clean energy and our biocarbons. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. But if you look kind of on the bottom here, we're able to really solve a number of problems. On the feedstock side, we're dealing with challenging materials that often have waste disposal uh, costs and issues associated with them. And we're creating valuable outputs that are seeing a growing market opportunity. So here's a picture of our, our facility we have in London, Ontario. Uh, the only additional point I'd like to make besides what we've already talked about is this system, the third line, the energy generation. The system creates this clean energy gas um, and I'll talk more about how we optimize that, but we actually can take a small amount of that to run the plant itself. So it's a thermal system, you know, we're getting it up to 800 degrees Celsius and we're able to get those temperatures using some of the gas the plant creates itself. So we're not running it off of say natural gas or electricity for the, the heating loads. It's all produced in-house, if you will. Now I wanna talk a little bit about some of the market catalysts for our output. So the first is green hydrogen. Now, most people will see green hydrogen as coming from a technology called electrolysis. You use electricity to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. The other green hydrogen pathway that has been identified, this little uh, graphic I borrowed from the Ontario Hydrogen Strategy, is through biomass and through technologies like ours. Um, so it's a little bit less known that that's a pathway to green hydrogen, but it is an accepted pathway. And what that does is it really puts us in a, a leadership position for distributed green hydrogen from biomass because our systems are generating hydrogen as part of the process, no matter what. And so our first proposed California facility will be processing that anaerobic digestate, that leftover from these biogas plants. And we'll be making about hundred kilograms per day or per hour, uh, sorry, this slide is, is, has a bit of a typo. That's 100 kilograms per hour of hydrogen. And the market price for hydrogen in California is anywhere between five and $10 a kilogram. So it's a very attractive um, opportunity for us. The second uh, renewable uh, clean energy output is renewable natural gas. So um, our system creates this hydrogen rich gas we can then take it through a very well-established technology called methanation, which combines the hydrogen with some of the carbon oxides in our gas and makes methane, which is the main component of renewable natural gas or natural gas. As I said earlier, for those of you who follow companies like Zbeck or Greenlane, uh, two uh, TSX listed companies, um, they participate in these 
uh, anaerobic digestion first generation technologies. And that's really where they're fed with organic wastes uh, in these big digesters. Uh, pyrolysis is a second generation technology. And primarily what we're fed with is woody biomass. And the important point here is that anaerobic digesters cannot convert woody biomass into renewable natural gas. And a recent study that was commissioned by Energir, which is the gas utility in Quebec, showed that for them to hit a RNG target in 2030, um, they would need about 80% of their gas to come from woody biomass through second generation technologies like ours into renewable natural gas because there's just not enough organic waste to feed these anaerobic digestion biogas facilities. So all that to say, you know, without you know, going to any, into any more technical detail is the market is really wide open for woody biomass into RNG. And that's the only way that these targets or mandates for renewable natural gas are going to be able to be met in these jurisdictions. So we're in a very uh, exciting position with our technology and its ability to convert woody and woody waste into renewable natural gas. And the final output, uh, we always produce two outputs. The one is the clean energy side, which again could be the net renewable natural gas or green hydrogen. The other is our biocarbons, one of which is bio coal. Now I want to point out, obviously, the, the market for biocoal is pretty extensive. The Ontario steel industry alone consumes 1.7 million tons per year. And the important uh, point here is that steel uh, blast furnaces require coal, not just to burn for heat, but it's actually part of the chemical process that's going on. So they need a solid carbon in their blast furnaces to operate. So they can't change heating sources because of this uh, chemistry that's going on. The other important point is that one ton of coal produces three tons of greenhouse gas emissions. One ton of bio coal, like our clean fire, replaces one ton of coal, so one to one ratio. And one ton of bio coal produces zero tons of greenhouse gases. So for every ton of bio coal that replaces coal, a facility will see their greenhouse gas emissions drop by three tons. And when we look at GHG pricing of around $170 a ton by 2030, um, it adds about an extra $510 to the cost of coal. And low quality coals are about you know, $50 a ton. You know, high quality met coal uh, could push 200, but generally it's a little under $200 a ton. So it's a significant cost increase and OPEX increase to these facilities. And this is why there's a big push for technologies like ours that are a drop in uh, coal replacement. And along those lines in, in March, we announced a thousand ton order for one of the large steel uh, processors here in Canada, here in Ontario. Uh, and for us, it's a milestone order because it really demonstrates the need and the desire to start adding this type of product into operational blast furnaces. And now I want to talk a little bit more about scale up. I'm just going to turn this alarm off here before it rings on me again. Um, and that is to, to look at scaling up our facility. So here's what, you know, a scaled up facility looks like. And our plan is to construct a system that will generate a million gigajoules per year of renewable natural gas uh, to get a sense of the market opportunity. Um, gas utilities like Fortis have a, have a mandate to not pay more than $30 a gigajoule. Uh, generally, we would expect pricing to be between $15 and $25 uh, for the RNG piece and to also produce 25,000 tons per year of bio coal. Uh, we would look at doing it as a phased approach. So the first phase would have about a $25 million price tag to produce half of those numbers. And then, you know, phase two would be full implementation. I probably don't need to spend too much time on this because it does get a lot of airtime, but just to say there is obviously a strong uh, push away from using products like coal. Uh, we certainly see a lot of push towards ESG reporting and uh, incremental improvements on uh, various industries ESG uh, metrics and certainly our products directly help 
influence and, and help the, the overall ESG metrics. And then one final piece on the technology, and that's on biosolids. So I mentioned it a little earlier in our presentation, but biosolids are the leftovers from a wastewater treatment plant. And the most important bullet point on this slide is the bullet right underneath the picture. And that is that landfill costs are increasing due to contamination concerns. And they're contaminated with a chemical or a family of chemicals uh, called PFAS, which are polyfluorinated alkyl substances, which you don't need to remember. But the important point is that they are in almost any consumer product that is non-stick or water resistant. So things like Teflon or Gore-Tex, it's in all of that type of consumer product. And there, the regulations in the US are coming down kind of fast and furious. Uh, if you were to listen to stuff that Aaron Brockovich talks about now, it's all around PFAS. Uh, there's a couple of movies out, you know, a Hollywood uh, drama called Dark Waters, a Netflix documentary called The Devil We Know, all about PFAS. And the reason we're seeing landfill costs increasing uh, for biosolids that are contaminated are twofold. One, biosolids used to be spread on fields as a method of disposal and a way to return nutrients to those fields. PFAS, you can't spread biosolids on a landfill. So now all of a sudden, the only real option is to send it to the landfill. But the landfill is concerned uh, because the PFAS will leach out into their uh, garbage juice that they have to pump out of the bottom of the landfill and treat. And if it's contaminated with the PFAS, it increases their liabilities. So with those two pressures, the price is going up pretty substantially. And you know the, the kind of punchline of this overall slide is we've done a lot of work with the leading uh, biosolids uh, processors and, and consulting firms over the last 12 months to show that our high temperature pyrolysis destroys PFAS in the biosolids, which allows the resulting uh, output to be then spread on fields again as a way to, to return nutrients and, and get that circularity back. Um, so it's a, a market, a very short-term, near-term market opportunity uh, that we're well poised to take advantage of as well. So a quick note on, on the overall business model. So at our core, you know, we're an engineering, you know, procurement project management firm uh, providing turnkey pyrolysis plants. That's the kind of central core, no matter what we're doing, that's the key. There are, of course, uh, opportunities where we're going to be pursuing a utility model where we will also be a, an owner. So that kind of uh, scope boundary ex expands a little bit. Um, no matter who owns the facility, us, uh, a third party or through a joint venture, uh, we will still see recurring uh, revenue through service and monitoring contracts, as well as through biocarbon and, and energy management fees. And so to quickly touch on, on management, uh, we've got Mark with us here and I'll let him introduce himself in a quick second. Uh, myself, I founded Char in 2011, uh, bringing some technology that my professor and I developed at the University of Toronto to market. Uh, that was back in 2011. Um, and certainly we're, we're excited to see where it goes. Uh, and Brian uh, has been the lead at Alltech Environmental Consulting. Uh, and really heads up the, the consulting group. So, so Mark, I'll let you do a quick uh, introduction for everyone. Sure, um, I've got uh, 20 years of uh, CFO experience with both uh, public and private companies. I started off my CFO career at Xenon Environmental, um, clean tech, that, that's, that's where it began. That's where it is now with Char. That's what's closest to, to my heart. Um, I've also had a, C, a CFO role with CDI Education, which was also a TSX uh, listed company in the education space. And I spent a couple years on uh, Bay Street as an analyst in, in the midst of uh, my CFO roles. Awesome, thanks Mark. And then a quick touch on, on the board. And, and of course we have all of these members listed on our website. Um, I think it's, a, it's an extremely strong board for the, the size of Char and certainly it's designed uh, for us to see that kind of really exponential growth uh, to have this, this type of board um, to 
give you the quick highlights. Bill um, was president of DuPont Canada and is now our board chair. Uh, James has a, a lot of background in clean tech in, in Canada. Eric's our, our well-established uh, Bay Street um, uh, view. Uh, Benj is well-respected uh, journalist and, and is certainly a good help for the, the IR. Uh, Jane came from a number of different public boards, so a lot of great experience, including uh, before that, she was the CEO of Sustainable Development Technology Canada. Uh, Nick Nanos, for those who don't know the name, uh, is often quoted in the media during uh, election time because he does a lot of really uh, great and well-respected polling. And Paul Pellegrini is the, the founder of uh, Sussex Strategy, which is a, a very well-established, well-known government relations firm. So we've got a pretty broad uh, range of skill sets on our, on our board to help push this company forward. Quickly on, on the capital market side, uh, insiders have about 25% ownership, uh, institutions just under 10, and then uh, the rest is, is public float. Um, and I think based on our historical, you know, the public markets are just starting to, to pay attention to char. And we certainly see that uh, attention grabbing uh, to continue as we push some of these projects forward. We are able to deploy them and, and really start the excitement. Uh, I think we're really just at the beginning here. So with that, uh, Martin, thanks for giving us the, the platform to do the presentation and I'm uh, looking forward to your questions and, and to the audience. What, what I find fascinating, there's, there's no silver bullet. There are a whole lot of silver bullets out there hitting different parts of the market. And when I hear stories like this, it's like, hey, we've got some hope that we've got some good solutions to to make the world a bit better. So uh, thank you very much. Absolutely. All right, sure. Have a great day, guys. All right, thanks, thanks everybody. Bye.